So I never had a Game Gear growing up because I was strictly a Nintendo kid. And having recently watched High Score on Netflix, I think I have a little bit deeper insight into why exactly that was. Part of Sega's marketing strategy was to make their brand just appear a little bit edgier by turning up the attitude a little bit with characters like Sonic, their rationale being that if they could capture that slightly older teenage audience, that the marketing would trickle down to a younger brother who would also want a Sega. And this would help in their fierce battle with Nintendo at the time to try to maintain market dominance in the console space. But as an only child who only grew up with Nintendo products like the Nintendo, Super Nintendo, and Nintendo 64, it wouldn't be until about 1999 when the Dreamcast came out that I would finally have a Sega of my own. So when all of my friends were playing their comparatively gigantic Sega Game Gears, I was still playing on my very much not backlit original Game Boy playing games like Mario Land and Tetris. And in truth, I never really resented that fact. Like, sure, it would have been cool to have, you know, a backlight for the Game Boy, but aside from just knowing that I had some friends who played it, I never actually felt any desire to really keep tabs on the Game Gear library or anything, because, again, for me, I was perfectly happy with the Game Boy. But now, having secured the analog pocket with the Game Gear adapter, I'm very interested in playing Game Gear games. So one of the first things that I did after that came in was I hit one of my local shops and I cleaned out just about every Game Gear game that they had that wasn't a sports title or, well, Tasmanian Devil. So having now played seven different Game Gear games, I thought what I would do today is kind of go through each one of them and get my thoughts after spending, I would say, about 30 minutes with each one of them to sort of get a feel for that system and the things that I probably missed out on in my childhood. Now, I don't think any of these are really heavy hitters, but again, I'm not a Sega aficionado, so if you happen to be a huge Sega fan, please do let me know in the comments below if there's some games that I should absolutely check out and should be, you know, part of my library at some point, and then, you know, maybe I can do a follow-up sometime where I go and seek out some of the games that you've suggested. Naturally, since we are talking about Sega here, the first three that I picked up were Sonic games, specifically Sonic 2, Sonic Chaos, and Sonic Triple Trouble. So let's just go ahead and knock those out now, since they're all kind of related, obviously. First up was Sonic 2, which I was surprised because it felt a lot slower than the raw speed that I would typically be used to in a Sonic game. And a big part of that, I think, is the fact that it didn't really include a spin dash or anything like that. Now, I did play Sonic 2 on the Genesis as a kid with friends, and I seem to remember it being a lot faster than the original Sonic, and I was kind of surprised here that Sonic 2 for the Game Gear did not have the spin dash, which obviously made everything feel a lot slower, and I think that's not necessarily a terrible thing, even though Sonic's very much based on speed. It just, to me, seemed like a slower, more methodical, platformy kind of Sonic, rather than like the raw speed, going through loops, and that kind of stuff. Now, even though I got the impression playing this one that as an earlier Sonic entry on the Game Gear that it was probably not the best graphics that the system had to offer, it at least seemed to perform pretty well, and I had fun playing it for the short time that I spent with it. Things like boss battles were intact, and a lot of it just felt like a Sonic game to me. However, there was one part that did not feel like a Sonic game to me, and that was when I encountered the hang gliding sections. I spent way too much time trying to get the hang of the controls for that, and it was just awful. I'm not sure if I just missed something, like I tried to look up, you know, some uh, FAQs to see if I could figure out what I was doing wrong, that I just could not get Sonic to stay in the air with this thing. But yeah, aside from that, I would say that it was perfectly fine. Definitely not my favorite Sonic game that I've ever played or anything like that. But seeing it at that age in those kind of graphics would have been really stunning, again, compared to what I would have been playing on a non-backlit Game Boy. Next up, I played Sonic Chaos, which came out in 93. Now this felt noticeably faster. The spin dash had returned, and I was very, very thankful for that because Sonic's just a lot cooler with the spin dash, right? But aside from the obvious speed increase, I also noticed that the graphics were a lot punchier than they were in Sonic 2. However, I think that kind of graphical fidelity came at a bit of a downside because I did notice there was slowdown in this that was very, very noticeable, which obviously you're playing a Sonic game, you probably want to avoid slowdown as much as possible. But I kind of get the impression that they were still coming to grips with the system and trying to figure out how to tap into the hardware most effectively. But with the return of the spin dash, levels that I played in Sonic Chaos felt a lot better to me. And truthfully, even though I know a lot of people do not appreciate slowdown in their games in any capacity, for earlier retro titles, it never really bothered me that much. If anything, it just gave me a little bit of an extra chance to appreciate the time that went into trying to make the graphics as punchy as they were. So between Sonic Chaos and Sonic 2, I would probably spend more time playing Sonic Chaos. And then finally, Sonic Triple Trouble, which is easily the best looking of the bunch, but I feel like that also comes at the expense of performance because it also had the worst slowdown of the bunch. And in that way, I kind of felt like it was like the Ian Malcolm of the Sonics on the Game Gear, right? Because they spent so much time maybe considering if they could make Sonic look this good on the Game Gear that maybe they didn't stop to consider if they should. But nonetheless, even though I did encounter even worse slowdown here, I still appreciated the graphical fidelity, and Sonic is as charming as ever. I love the idle animations when he's just kind of hanging out. The music in Sonic games is pretty much always amazing. And ultimately, like Chaos, I feel like Triple Trouble is one I would actually want to see through to completion. 
So yeah, it was really kind of interesting to see how Sonic evolved over three years of the Game Gear, since it seems like these releases came out in 92, 93, and 94, based on what I read up on. And while I feel like they hit, you know, sort of like the peak visual performance in terms of how great Sonic could look with Triple Trouble, I think Chaos probably is like the perfect middle ground between Sonic 2 and Triple Trouble. So that would be the one that I would probably gravitate to first. But yeah, they were all charming in their own way, and I probably wouldn't mind finishing any one of these, except for two, because that hang gliding really was heinous and it really bugged me. Next up is a puzzle game that I picked up called Super Columns. Now, from what I could gather from the box art, which is really all I had to go on because, again, I had not done a ton of research into Game Gear games prior to going and picking all of these up, I sort of assumed it was going to be like Tetris. I mean, it seemed to have little pieces that were falling from the sky that you would probably arrange in some way to clear, and that was something that would be familiar to me as somebody who grew up playing games like Tetris and Dr. Mario. What I was not expecting is that this particular puzzle game has a story mode, which I mean, I know they talked about making a Tetris movie, but I just never really thought of puzzle games as being something that was particularly well lent to a narrative, unless you were talking about a game like maybe Puzzle Quest or something, where there's a lot more going on aside from just, you know, the raw puzzle gameplay. Now, even though I was expecting it to be like Tetris, there were some key differences that I thought were pretty interesting. For starters, it's not just that you can actually rotate the pieces, but you can also shift the position of the individual dots in each piece as it falls. So I feel like that really added a layer of strategy and complexity to it. And also it was odd to me because normally for games like this, I expect that I'm going to be positioning pieces either horizontally or vertically, but here you could also do it diagonally to get clears. I think after I spend some more time with it and get used to it, I might have a greater affinity for it. But as it stands, after just playing it for like 20 or 30 minutes, it really didn't grab me in a significant way. It certainly doesn't hold, you know, a candle to, you know, Tetris or my personal favorite puzzle game of all time, Luminous. But nonetheless, if you were somebody who had a Game Gear back then and were really into puzzle games, then you'd probably find some enjoyment in Super Columns. So if there's one game that I was most excited for out of what I managed to stumble across, just kind of, you know, seeking out Game Gear games for the first time, it would be X-Men. Specifically because when I was a kid in the 90s, I was always a little bit jealous of my friends who had a Genesis because they got the X-Men game that had Nightcrawler. And the only way I could play Nightcrawler is if I went and played the X-Men Arcade at my local Pizza Hut. And other than that, I had no way to play as Nightcrawler, you know, on a home console or anything. So when it comes to all the games that I was looking for for the Game Gear, I was like, ooh, this is probably going to be awesome. I loved X-Men when I was a kid and I loved playing the X-Men Arcade game. But tragically, even though it was the one I most looked forward to, it's probably the game that I liked the least out of the bunch. Prize I might, I just could not get into this. Now, right out of the gate, you can choose to be either Cyclops or Wolverine. I went with Wolverine because I'm not a narc. And when it comes to actually playing the game and engaging in combat, it was just so incredibly slow that I just, I could not stand it. And the first level didn't do it any favors either because you're essentially just jumping into elevators over and over and just kind of punching random generic looking criminal bad guys. And even with the claws popped for Wolverine, nothing about it really stuck out to me. Like the combat was not very fun and just slowly walking from one elevator to the next when the whole level kind of looked the same uh, was not fun. It was not really something that I could get into. And I actually looked up some playthroughs of this game and I was like, okay, maybe I'm missing a run button or something somewhere, but Nope, it looks like it's just uh, sort of slow and meandering, and even though I love the X-Men, specifically 90s X-Men, I just really couldn't get into this, so I, I spent maybe, maybe 15 minutes with it, and I was like, I, I just can't do it, this is not, it's not fun, you know. It's not like there haven't been better X-Men games, like X-Men Legends, or, you know, to a lesser degree, I guess you could say uh, Marvel Ultimate Alliance, even though that wouldn't be more like a pure X-Men game, it's kind of like the whole Marvel bunch, right? So, knowing that I could play games like that, even on the PSP, probably not going to be a game that I ever return to. Not what I was expecting for the 90s X-Men Legacy, to put it bluntly. And speaking of Legacy, the next game is one that I was relatively certain I would have fun with because I spent so much time with its console big brother, and that is Mortal Kombat 2. When Mortal Kombat 2 first came out, there was a Hills department store and they had a big display set up where kids could try out games by hitting a button that would cycle through the different cartridges. And I can't believe they just left Mortal Kombat 2 in there. I feel like most parents would not have wanted their kid to just stumble across a Mortal Kombat 2 game. It's a game that I spent a ton of time with on the Super Nintendo when I was a kid. And while I didn't expect that this would really aspire to the same heights as what I would get from the console version, obviously, uh, I still thought it would be a pretty playable version. And honestly, it is a pretty playable version. No, the frame rate isn't the best. It's definitely going to be a little bit slower than what you would be used to playing in the arcade or on a Super Nintendo or a Genesis or something like that. But for what it was, I actually had a pretty good time with it. And my only real goal in playing this one was to see if I could pull off one fatality on the Game Gear version of Mortal Kombat 2. And I'm happy to say that I did pull off one fatality, or at least I think I did. It took me a little bit of time to get the spacing down to do one of Sub-Zero's fatalities. And it was weird because the screen went dark. I think I did a fatality, but I didn't see like the word fatality pop up or anything, but it certainly looked like I'd triggered the finishing move whenever I you know, finally performed it. 
But yeah, all things considered, I was pleasantly surprised with Mortal Kombat 2 on the Game Gear. And I think I went in a little bit, you know, skeptical about this one in particular because I'd played Mortal Kombat on the Game Boy and that was not a great experience. But if you were a kid in the 90s and you wanted to play Mortal Kombat on the go, I imagine this was an absolute godsend. And again, while it certainly didn't ascend to the heights of the console versions, it's definitely playable. And if you were just an absolute junkie for that kind of arcade fighting and wanted to do it on the go, this was probably a great way to do it. Now, is it one I would ever return to over the Super Nintendo version? No. No, it is not. But still, an impressive effort for the Game Gear, I think. And finally, the last game that I picked up was Deep Duck Trouble. Now, I've always had a fondness for Disney games as somebody who grew up in the 90s playing like Capcom classics like Chip and Dale Rescue Rangers or DuckTales. So seeing Donald Duck on an adventure where he's trying to save Uncle Scrooge seemed like a no-brainer for me. So I went ahead and grabbed this, and actually I really liked this one a lot more than I thought I would. I thought that maybe just my nostalgia would overwhelm my ability to find a good game for the Game Gear. But ultimately it was fun. Like the level of platforming are perfectly fine, like the animation's interesting, the music's poppy and fun. And it seems like each one of the stages that you select sort of culminates in a boss battle where you have to run away from something. And I had a good time kind of playing like, you know, this sort of infinite runner mode boss battle that will pop up at the end of each level. And as somebody who grew up playing a ton of Disney games like DuckTales or Darkwing Duck or Mickey's Castle of Illusion, all those things, it seemed like this would be a good pick. And I'm happy to report that it was. And I'll probably go ahead and finish this one just because, you know, it seemed like a, a nice little throwback and I have a lot of love for DuckTales anyways. So yeah, I think this was probably one of the higher up ones on my list of Game Gear games that I just randomly went out and bought blindly. So yeah, all this being said, I am glad that I went for the Game Gear adapter for the Analog Pocket. That being said, I probably could have picked some higher quality titles for my first foray into that system. But that did lead me to start exploring other games from the library by looking at YouTube videos, checking out some ROMs and things like that. And I think that's what my next video is going to be about are some of the games that I would like to track down for the Game Gear. But hey, again, if you're a Sega aficionado and you know the Game Gear front to back and have any suggestions of a game that just absolutely should be in my collection, please let me know because I would have no way of knowing otherwise. As always, thanks for taking the time out of your day to watch the videos. I really appreciate it. Have an amazing day, and I'll see you on the next one.